If you're a person who likes adventure and loves running into the unexpected, then join us and become the surprise traveler. See beautiful landscapes, wildlife revealing their secrets, fascinating architecture, We know you, as our fellow travelers, will cherish the journey. Amazing people and cultures that we cannot resist. Stories that captivate us. And share a laugh with us at the funny happenstances we stumble upon. Wonderful, spellbinding surprises await us as we take adventures around the globe. Every continent and country has its own treasures to be explored. In this episode, we focus our attention on the Queen and her palaces, British TV shows, and an interview with a Portsmouth resident expert on the King's Theatre, a famous Portsmouth performance theatre that has been saved from destruction multiple times and is under threat again with the coronavirus. According to my lovely wife, there just isn't a chance that we're going to Great Britain without seeing the Queen's palaces. We didn't see them all, but we did see four out of six. I have to admit, I always find something unusual and learn something interesting in these tours, but I wanted to do more than just see a bunch of palaces. This led to multiple adventures as we share with you a visit to the Queen's palaces. Our first palace, is the Queen's official residence in London, Buckingham Palace. Buckingham Palace is the primary residence of Queen Elizabeth II and her husband, Prince Philip. It is also the official administrative offices for the monarchy of the United Kingdom. Next to the palace is St. James Park, full of flowers, open space, and fresh air. Leading up to the palace, is the British flag lined Mall Boulevard. Here I dodge London cabs to shoot a video as we make our way to take a tour inside of Buckingham Palace. Before we go into the palace residence, we stop by the Queen's Gallery where we see a wonderful exposition of Leonardo da Vinci's drawings. What a mind this man had, genius. So interested in so many topics, this was an unexpected treat. We go to another entrance that takes us in to see the Royal Muse Queen stables. Here we see some of the Queen's horses as they're being admired by their handlers. As we step outside, we see how large of an area it is, especially considering we're in the heart of London. We take a self-guided tour of the facility. Our first stop is a collection of the Queen's numerous carriages. Here are four to give you an idea of their craftsmanship. As we go inside another Muse building, we see the royal harnesses used for the horses and observe man's best friend guarding the grounds. Did I say guarding? Well, he was there at any rate. As we go through additional horse stalls, I see up ahead what turns out to be the carriage, the gold state coach. You can see from these pictures that this is a very special carriage gilded with gold. In addition to its pure beauty, what I found fascinating was that it is 260 years old and was commissioned to be built in 1760 by King George III, and it has been used in every king or queen's coronation ever since then. Starting with his successor, King George IV, who was coronated in 1821, followed by King William IV in 1831, Queen Victoria in 1838, King Edward II in 1902, King George V in 1911, King George VI in 1938, and Queen Elizabeth II in 1953. For you history buffs, did you know King George III was the longest reigning monarch at 59 years until Queen Victoria surpassed it with 63 years. And now Queen Elizabeth II's 67 years surpasses that and she's still counting. King George III was called the Mad King because in his later years, he acted out delusions and hallucinations among other symptoms of something we know today as porphyria, a rare genetic disease. 
King George III was credited with winning the Seven Year Wars over France and her allies. It's also known as the French and Indian War. But he was blamed for allowing the colonists in America to gain their independence from England in the American Revolutionary War. King George III is Queen Elizabeth II's third great-grandfather. King George III is also the monarch that bought Buckingham Place back in 1762, which is transformed into Buckingham Palace today. Speaking of the palace, we finally go inside to see the palace staterooms. Once in the palace, we're not disappointed. The staterooms are elegant and impressive. The art collection is enjoyable. You can see from these portraits of the throne room the influence that Queen Victoria's era has left on the interior decorations. The attention to detail is evident everywhere, even on the ceilings. Our favorite stateroom is the White Room, used for audiences with the monarch and small gatherings. It's a dazzling room to visit. As you see in this painting, on top of a hill and covering 13 acres is a beautiful castle about 90 minutes out of London in Berkshire County. We're here in the town of Windsor to explore Windsor Castle. The castle was built in the 11th century and is the longest occupied palace in Europe. It is the queen's country residence. She spends most weekends here and takes up official residence for a month over Easter, March to April, known as Easter Court. Upon entering the grounds, we go across the castle courtyard and come up a flight of stairs onto the top of Castle Tower. We have a great vantage point up here to see in any direction. We see the castle grounds, royal residences, and other buildings below. It is a vast and scenic view as we gaze upon the town of Windsor and surrounding Berkshire County's countryside. Remember King George III? He died here on January 29, 1820, and is buried in a tomb within the castle. Maybe a more interesting note for some of you, the St. George Chapel within the castle walls is where Prince Harry and Meghan Markle were married on May 18, 2018. As we turn our gaze from Arthur's seat in Edinburgh to the city below, we see the Queen's official Scottish residence when she's in Scotland, the Palace of Holyrood House. This palace originated around the guest house of Holyrood Abbey, founded in 1128 by King David I. It was during the 15th century that the guest house was transformed into a royal residence. We take a tour of the grounds, starting by walking around the back by the abbey side of the structure. As we walk, we learn the structure has been expanded further. In particular, King George V renovated the palace by, among other things, adding electricity during his reign. As we continue our walk, we see the very lovely palace gardens at a distance. And as we approach the other side of the abbey, we admire the architectural design of the structure that still remains from the 1100s. As we return to the front of the palace, we enter the front entrance. And as we pass through, we see a pretty grass courtyard inside, surrounded by state we explore inside the palace and see the great gallery hall, stop at the throne room, did you, the palace dining room, and the king's bedchamber. Did you know this palace is where Mary Queen of Scots, who reigned from 1542 to 1567, lived for much of her most difficult years of her life? She married twice, and her second husband, Lord Darnley, was the jealous type. We end our tour of the palace at what was Mary's private apartment. This is the place where David Rizzio, her secretary, was murdered by thugs hired by her husband, Lord Darnley, who didn't like Rizzio's influence over Mary. Ultimately, Mary, Queen of Scots, was beheaded, but that is another story. As soon as the gates of the 50,000-acre Balmoral estate open and we make our way to the Balmoral Castle, I'm struck by the serenity of my surroundings. Balmoral is located in Ballater, Scotland, close to the edge of where the northeastern lowlands meet the highlands in the Karagarn Mountains. This is a working estate where they manage the land as well as highland cattle, grouse hunting, and deer hunting. The castle has been the Scottish home of the English royal family since the original building and grounds were purchased for Queen Victoria by Prince Albert in 1852. He later rebuilt it for Queen Victoria's enjoyment. Additional estate acreage has been added over the years. 
It is one of two estates that Queen Elizabeth II inherited and privately owns. It is considered one of her favorite residences. She comes here every year, usually during August and September. Her Majesty's been known to invite British Prime Ministers up here for weekends away. Lucky them. We are allowed only to go around the outside of the castle with the exception of a guest hall off the back of the main building. However, we've found a couple of photos of the Queen's office and a living area to remove some of the mystery. The castle grounds include colorful flower gardens by the castle and on the other side of the lawn. We stop off to see the beautiful displays of plants and flowers in a small conservatory. There's also a small cottage alongside the gardens. We take our leave regretfully, having thoroughly enjoyed our visit as we stroll the peaceful castle grounds of this country estate, admiring its charm. It is a worthwhile stop we hadn't planned, spending a couple of hours enjoying the fresh air, embracing the comfortable Scottish countryside around a such magnificent estate. The final palace we want to share with you is the second of the Queen's privately owned home estates that sits on 20,000 acres in Sandringham, Norfolk, on the English coastland. It is called the Sandringham House. We are told that the Queen always spends Christmas and New Year's here with the royal family. We didn't actually see this palace, but we found a few photos to share with you. One of the chancel on the grounds, and sitting room and drawing rooms within the palace, plus the one where she broadcasts her famous annual address to the nation. Worth noting, Anmer Hall also sits on this estate, and it is a country residence the Queen gave to Prince William for him and his family. Now that we've seen the fantasy-like settings where the Queen and her royal family live, we're going to see fantasy brought to life through film and theater. Let's go visit some English locations where two of our favorite British TV shows have been shot. In our first adventure, we search for the fictional county in England called Midsummer. The setting for one of our favorite British TV crime drama mystery series is Midsummer Murders. An area just outside of London in Buckinghamshire and Oxfordshire counties is where the majority of this filming occurs. This series has been a continuous hit since 1997. We enjoy the quirky characters who are always entertaining, even if the plots are always multiple murders due to unusual circumstances. But it is not presented in a dark and ugly way. In fact, another attraction we thoroughly enjoy are the country settings and quaint villages that provide the backdrop for the show's scenes. We start in Buckinghamshire County in Hamlinton, a very small village used to open an episode as a young girl is riding a bike with a wagon of gypsies coming up the street behind her. Here's the TV scene. Now here's the actual street and the buildings that are the backdrop of the action. Here you can see the TV scene overlaid onto the shot that I took. Here are some other locations used in the series, including Henley on Thames, one of the three locations used to depict the fictional town of Coston, the headquarters and home for Detective Chief Inspector Tom Barnaby from 1997 to 2011, and then his cousin John Barnaby since then. Here is a scene with Tom Barnaby, and here is my picture of the same general background location, but closer up. Did you know the famous English singer Dusty Springfield lived her last few years in Henley on Thames. She was quite popular in America in the 1960s. She died from breast cancer on March 2nd, 1999 at the age of 59. Her funeral services were held here at St. Mary the Virgin in Henley on Thames. This marker in the church graveyard is dedicated to her memory. Let's close off in Warborough, a small village in South Oxfordshire, often used in different episodes. Warborough's Village Green features a cricket pavilion as the Badgers Drifts episodes Village Hall. The Six Bells Pub is just across the green and features as the Black Swan Pub in the same episode. British TV isn't all about murders. We travel southwest to the Cornwall area to the land of another TV series we love, Doc Martin. A light-hearted comic look at a small coastal village's general practitioner, tolerated for his rude manner but loved for his ability to handle any medical emergency. Welcome to Doc Martin's quirky hometown of Port Wynn really Port Isaac. After watching this show for years, we feel totally familiar with the narrow streets, breathtaking views, and recognizable landmarks. We stayed in the Portwind Schoolhouse Hotel, and out of our window, we can view Doc Martin's surgery. 
The best part of our visit is experiencing the beautiful and charming seaside sights, sounds, and fresh air. In between rain clouds, we get a beautiful afternoon, dramatic views of the village's seaside cliffs, active port activity, and neighborhoods that make up Port Isaac. Our hotel originally was the Port Isaac Schoolhouse years ago. In fact, we met a gentleman that told us he went to school in this building. Of course, in real life, it is a hotel, bar, and restaurant. But in Doc Martin, this location serves as the facade for the Port Wynn Elementary School, and the parking lot is used as the playground. You might notice in the TV show that the parking lot lines are not removed from the show's scenes. Where do Doc Martin's characters fictionally live in the show? If you go up the main road where the schoolhouse is located, you'll find Louisa's apartment when she wasn't living with a Doc who is now her husband. If you go down the same road toward the bottom of the hill, you'll run into the Golden Lion Pub that Al Large operates and his wife, Morwenna, and Bert, Al's father, assist. Once at the bottom of the hill, we see the location for the pharmacy where Mrs. Tischel lives and continues to try and find a way to get the doc's favor. If we take a left from the pharmacy and go up a couple of narrow streets, we will find Doc Martin's Aunt Ruth's house. Here Martin Clunes, that's Doc Martin, is standing on Ruth's doorstep. Not too far from here is also a location where Doc Martin lived before moving into the surgery. Back down these narrow paths and back by the pharmacy, we're off to the doc's surgery and home that's facing the harbor. Up a long and narrow street, we arrive at the surgery with a spectacular view of the Harbor Bay and Village. If you're confused by all of this rubbish I've been bantering about, then I recommend you watch the series, have some fun, and this will all start to make sense. Enough TV. Let's talk to our guest for this episode and learn more about live theater in Portsmouth, England. In this segment of our show, we talk to individuals that live in the country we're visiting to get a more intimate understanding of their interests and hear some stories we didn't hear during our visit. Today, we have Keith Stoneman with us from Portsmouth, England, a retired business executive, community volunteer, amateur thespian, and longtime local supporter of Portsmouth's famous King's Theater. Portsmouth is located on the south southern coast of England, directly north across the English Channel from Lower Normandy in France. England's naval fleet is stationed in this port city. Keith is going to share a little of his own background and relationship to the historical King's Theater. I find this story of helping protect a local historic building underscores the importance, the impact of a small group of individuals can have in helping preserve and protect a community's culture, continuing a legacy of love for the theater. Keith, thank you for joining us. Would you be kind enough to introduce yourself and tell our viewers a bit more about your background? When I retired uh, in 1982, that much later, it was from uh, Chase Bank. So we, then we decided to move back down to the south coast that we'd been uh, living in earlier. And uh, life went on from that point all along the south coast, which of course brought us then into the orbit of the King of Theatre and many other local uh, activities that we were able to join in. So, sadly, it was in 2010 that the dreaded cancer caught up with Pamela. And so life changed dramatically from that time. Now we finished up here in this apartment, which has the finest views in the area. It certainly does. Uh, we look across to the Isle of Wight which is only 20 minutes by hovercraft if we need to go across to the island to visit any time. I assume you really enjoy living in Portsmouth. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, it's not my native area. I was born and brought up in South London, uh, but I've moved around to other parts of the country since then. Back up just a second, though, and tell me a little bit about your beginnings with Pamela, because that's kind of the beginning of the theater connection as well. Well, it was indeed. That's right. Yes. Uh, as I mentioned, we we had this, uh, what I think was unique then and possibly unique today, I've not heard of it uh, again, whereby uh, a cast of residents, uh, a cast of uh, actors, actresses, would put on plays that nobody knew about that were, were written by would-be authors and tried out 
in front of uh, the audience by these actors, actresses, uh, to see whether they were worth publicizing and uh, would get published or taken up by theatrical management or what. Um, so by joining that cast and getting a number of parts to play, uh, it gave me a great deal of spare time interest. And it was then that this other cast member was introduced. We found ourselves cast with each other. It gave us the opportunity to be together quite a bit. Uh, and then, as I said, I started to take out and about even beyond the theatre. And uh, the rest is history, as they say. So if you could tell me just a little bit about the King's Theatre and um, why it's important to your area and, and maybe some history about it. King's Theatre, which is an historical uh, and outstanding and specialist theatre, not many of which exist in the country. In fact, it was uh, opened to the public with inaugural plays and so on in 1907. And uh, it was designed and built by a man named Frank Matcham, who was a prolific architect building theatres all over the country, very few of which have sadly survived, uh, either been knocked down or turned into bingo holes or whatever. And South Sea King Theatre is about one of five that survived from the Matram era. It was conceived, built and financed by a, a, a local businessman in uh, Portsmouth, a wealthy businessman named uh, J. Nell Broughton, uh, and in fact his granddaughter, part of the scene of the modern celebs that used the theatre. So it had a program all through the 1930s. It was quite successful. It was something of a novelty. There weren't too many live theatres. Cinema was very uh, early on, a few black and white films and so on. So as a source of entertainment, it, it really did quite well and, and grew. But then came the war of World War II in 1939, and uh, the thing slowed down because most of the male public were called to arms, and the whole social background to the city was uh, reduced. So at the end of the war, in 1945, this is when a naval commander that had recently retired from the Navy and clearly had made a few shillings uh, decided to buy it because he was married to an actress, uh, Joan Cooper, well known at the time, uh, who was keen to continue in the stage. So a good way for her to do that was to have her husband buy the theatre. And that went on under his ownership and indeed a number of successive ownerships when Reggie died. Uh, right up to a point where the Hampshire County Council, the local authoritative body, stepped in to buy it rather than see it tumble into dust on the ground, as it were. And they put it up for sale. And so it took a local businesswoman, uh, Mrs. Paddy Drew, to organize a public meeting. And so the following day, I happened to ring this Mrs. Paddy Drew, whom I didn't know, other than uh, as a local resident. And I said, you did a good job with the meeting last night, but you didn't do this, and you didn't do that, you didn't do the other, which you might have done, it was a lost opportunity. And this is when she said, well, if you're so damn clever, come and join us and do something about it. So I was hooked. This is where I got involved with the theater and joined a small group that became known as Actor, A-K-T-E-R, which was the mnemonic and rather a useful one. So uh, it became a matter then of, of uh, dealing with the theatre through this uh, subcommittee, which managed to recruit quite a few local volunteers to rally yeah. around. And when he started doing things like stripping off all the wallpaper that had been put up around the auditorium and uh, around the stage and wherever by mm -hmm. Reggie, uh, Reggie Cooper, when he'd owned it, yeah. and revealed underneath beautiful Victorian tiles. Wow. Uh, so when it was built originally uh, back in the 1900s, they'd used top quality materials. Right. And although there were 
small puncture marks here and there. Tile had fallen off. It was still in pretty good shape. And yeah. part of the restoration came to make good those tiles and do away with all this horrid wallpaper stuff, which made the place look run down. So uh, right. we started building up a program again with visiting artists, putting on shows of all kinds. Okay. And back in those days, this is uh, a little bit later now than the 1980s, we had people like uh, Laurel and Hardy. Oh. We had people oh. like Sh Sean Connery, who later became Mr. Bond. Right. Uh, all of these people were on the touring circuit and uh, performed at the King's Theatre, acknowledged to be one of the finest survival theatres in the whole country. Didn't it get some recognition um, within uh, England? Uh, and yes, that's, that's good. Uh, the, the lady I mentioned already, uh, Patty Drew, um, who, as I said, had uh, f formulated the salvage operations, uh, she went on to get a national award, which was called the OBE, the Order of British Empire, which okay. is one of the standard honors that can be dispensed by the, uh, the Queen and the uh, central government uh, as a recognition of the work contributed. So she had to go to the palace and get this right. uh, well, that, that's excellent. medal formally awarded. Right. And that was for basically saving the theater? Absolutely right, yes. Exactly that. Okay. And when you were involved in the renovation, did you get directly involved in the renovation, you and Pam? Oh, I, indeed. I, I, okay. They've grown back again now, but I would have had the fingernails to prove it. <laughs> draping off all this wallpaper, using the skirting boards. and I mean, it wasn't just me. There were a bunch right. of volunteers. But uh, certainly it was hard work. We used to go every Saturday and uh, spend the day there okay. on restoration. And I recruited one or two friends to join as well. So we had quite a good team working away there. It must have been exciting. It must have been very fulfilling as well when you uncovered those things. It, it was, there's no question. Uh, uh, to restore the, the beauty, and it, it was a beautifully designed theater, um, to restore that as it used to be and had been intended right. by Matcham. Well, the theater must have um, a charmed life because it's had several close calls over the years, it sounds like. Well, it, it certainly had. And uh, I think I've said earlier that uh, the fact that uh, Pomostos was so badly bombed during the war and many buildings destroyed, many cinemas destroyed, auditorium, and the Kings got away with it, apart from the odd right. pane of broken glass or something. But uh, mm -hmm. structurally, it survived. Yeah. Well, and it, it's also um, a tribute to the citizens there that if it hadn't been for you and, and other people like you, it very well would have gone by the wayside. I think that's absolutely true, yes, yes. So in a sense, the theater's a legacy for all of you. Absolutely, yes. Again, uh, thank you so much. I look forward to okay. following up with you, and uh, well, let's stay in touch. Tell you good, Doug. Thanks a lot. We covered a lot of ground in this episode, but we have part two for England in our next episode. We explore London and the surrounding area, experience some English culture, and share the surprises we found in the wizardly world of Harry Potter. Keith Stone will also be joining us again and sharing his insights on additional Portsmouth treasures that tie into the sites we see in our travels. As we roll the credits, let's go shopping at Harrods and Selfridges, two famous department stores in London. <laughs>